Hey, everybody, welcome to another episode of Working Class Hollywood. Before we get into this episode, I'm going to ask you guys, as I always do, if you haven't already, please go on to iTunes or Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, wherever you're listening to this show, and please subscribe, leave a review, leave a comment, drop a rating, whatever you do. Uh, It is really helpful to the show, and it does help get it out there into more people's ears. So please go engage and leave me some feedback. I do really like hearing from people, and I look forward to seeing what you say. All right, let's get to the show. Welcome to Working Class Hollywood, conversations with people that make the movies, TV shows, and entertainment you love. If you're looking to break into or move up in the entertainment industry, or you're just a fan of content and want to hear about how it's made, this is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Jeremiah Smith. My guest today is head of development at Kinetic Content, Carrie Wolf. Carrie and I have known each other a very long time. We worked together way back in the day at UTA, the agency. Uh, she has gone on to do very, very, very cool things. She works in reality television development. So if you have ever had an idea for a reality show, if you've ever thought, oh, my group of friends would make a great reality show, or you wanted to try to pitch or sell a show to a network, Carrie is one of the people that would help get that idea fully fleshed out and then into the hands of a network. Uh, We talk all about the process of developing for reality TV. We actually just went through it together. We have a project together that we talk about here during the episode. Uh, We talk about Kinetic and all the cool shows that they do. And uh, we reminisce about all the good times we've had together through the years. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Carrie Wolf. All right. I'm here with Carrie Wolf. Hello. Executive Vice President, Head of Development for Kinetic yes. Content. Um, Carrie. Yes. Carrie and I have known each other for a long time. Really long time. We were both at UTA, yep. United Talent Agency, in like 2000. And th- I started in 2003. Okay. I think. Yeah. I was like a young whippersnapper, like young agent coordinator in 2003 so yeah you were like the coordinator for like the alternative department alternative but you sat out in like the bullpen row with all the the assistants so i think that's i was an assistant and we we met and were you ruth ann's assistant yeah i I was ruth ann secunda yep and then shaney rosenzweig okay so you went ruth ann then shaney yeah i did like about a year on each of their each of their desks. Right. So you were like two or three desks down from me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. On that like fifth floor. Yes. Out in like the big area yes. where like all the the whole TV department was. Totally. Yeah. Wow. It was it was uh it was fun. Those were good days. Yeah. I I actually do remember my agency days very fondly. Yeah. Like it was fun. Yeah. It was like it, you know I learned a ton. It was fun. We were both young. Yeah. So I mean and like learned a ton. Yeah, and getting to go to like you know being Events. like twenty three and like being able mm-hmm. to go to like premieres and parties yeah. and like tapings like uh they they re- all represented the that 70s show like every yeah. actor on that 70s like Wilmer show Valderrama. Wilmer and Topher Grace yep. and Laura Prepon and Danny McBride or whoever Danny Masterson, Danny Masterson yep. and like oh, yeah, uh they, did. they and so and they you were, were like you were a talent assistant yeah. so your boss was getting to talk you you were l- listening in on conversations with like tv actors oh yeah which was super fun. Yeah. And we'd go to like the, interesting, the tapings bet. of that 70s show and like yeah. hang out in the green room, and like play That's video cool. games with Topher Grace. And But you were <laughs> always such a nice guy that you stuck out because, you know, when I'd be like sitting at my desk and, you know, like people would like, you know, people from the mailroom would be pushing the mail carts by. They'd be like scared to talk to people, right? They'd be scared <laughs> to talk to the other assistants or you know, the agents or the young agents who sat in the bullpen, but you'd be like, hey, how's it going? What's up? That's why I liked it. You're so nice. That's Um, why I liked the mailroom because I I was, I would jump at the chance to go and 
push the mail cart because I just loved and I still I mean I still do I, but that's still who you I'm are. doing a podcast about t- yeah. talking to people but I just like to talk to people get I to know, know people that's, and like that's why you're good at what you do here's your mail Seriously. so how was your weekend <laughs> totally you were so nice <laughs> I always liked you and you used to be a server at BJ's right yeah okay yeah. I remember this conversation because you told me what a pazuki was. Yeah. And I was like, what is a pazuki? <laughs> and you're like, it's one of those pizza cookies. And I'm like, get out. I'm from Indiana. I should know what a pazuki is. <laughs> and so, like, I actually always remember that. Because they have pazukis at Trader Joe's and I'll get they them occasionally. Do? Yeah. What? Yeah, you just put them in the oven. <gasps> and then you put a scoop of ice cream on them. I didn't know. And that. Um, I always think that Jeremiah is who told me what a pazuki was. So, you know what's funny is that, like, like 15 years later or however far away we are from that i'm still like the pazuki prophet like i like my bill langworthy the showrunner of vanderpump rules like i also offhandedly for some reason mentioned bj's and he's like oh, i've never been and i was like what you've never had a pazuki get there right now and so then he did and he like sent me a picture like six months later of like his pazuki and it's like it always holds up no one goes and eats a pazuki and it's like right yeah mm, just no. uh didn't do it for me. Didn't fulfill me. No, it's no, like- no, no. It's it is literally like a skillet of happiness. <laughs> it makes you feel whole. You know, it's like crack. And I haven't been to BJ's in a while. Is there one in Century City or no? I think so. I gotta mm. go. There's one in Westwood. Maybe uh, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, I gotta go. That's the one I worked at when I was in at UCLA. Maybe when we get our show picked up, we'll go there and celebrate. <laughs> celebrate with Pazookies. Which I know I'm getting ahead of myself. That's right. Well, yeah, we also, so we've stayed in touch through the years, uh, and I've, you know, brought you a couple shows through the years, and yep. and now, uh, and I brought you a show a while back, and now yep. it's a thing. Yes, it's we hopefully, sold it. Sold it, and it's yeah. going to hopefully be a TV show. It's going to be a TV show. It's so good. We can't talk about we can't details, talk about it but all. just, you know, stay tuned. Set it's your, really good. Set your DVRs for, just type in the best TV show ever, and it'll pop up, and you can, <sighs> it's gonna be, you I can mean, record it. I mean, from the producer of Vanderpump, you, Von, Vanderpump Rules, and the production company behind Married at First Sight and other shows. You just gave me an idea for another show called Vanderpump You. Oh. And it's where we digital get, show for get young people that want to be on Vanderpump. And then we like train them and put them through like Sir Olympics. Yes. And they have to like, how many goat cheese balls to, like, can you serve in right? like a, three minutes? And like, Yeah. What, how fast can you sew? He, like hem your hem little dress. dress. <laughs> How much white wine can you drink before you barf? Like those kind of like <laughs> totally. Vanderpump you. Totally. University. How fast can you like put Sh- Sheena's hair in like a top knot? <laughs> How fast can you put her nails on? <laughs> I think. Well, so this is our second show that we're that we're <laughs> going to sell. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, then, so let's uh, let's rewind. Go back a little bit. Um, just tell me how so this is about you. Okay. You know, because we want to get to know. Well, for, just tell me what's Kinetic? What does Kinetic do for those, for people that don't know? Kinetic is a production company. We're almost 10 years old. We produce shows like Married at First Sight on Lifetime, uh, Little Women, which is on Lifetime. Uh, we have a new show premiering. Actually, it just dropped on Netflix today called Love is Blind. Oh, is it out? Uh, yeah, today. Oh, I want to watch it. It, it looks so good. Yeah, it's The really trailer good. looks amazing. It's really good. Well, I didn't realize when you when you sort of told me the concept, I was like, oh, okay. And I like imagine it's sort of like almost like the circle where they're in like these pods and they can't see each other. And I, th- I thought that was the whole show. No. But then I saw they're... the trailer and they like, mm-hmm. it's like The Bachelor and they're like going on vacations. And oh, yeah. They and... live together, move in together and they're engaged and some of them. And so... um it's really good. Uh, I'm gonna watch I'm it. I'm not just saying that because it's our show. It's it's very good. So, so we're a TV production company. We specialize in non scripted, and we've got shows. At I mean, we just had a show on Discovery Channel called Man vs. Bear. We had a show on Bravo. It's airing still called Spy Games. You guys do Spy Games? Yeah, I that's didn't our know show. that. I didn't know that. And we have, gosh, we've done network shows like The Taste with Anthony Bourdain, Nigella Lawson. We had a show called Off the Rockers with Betty White on NBC. So yeah, we're just producing all different types of shows. Um, that's who we are. So uh, I want to. We'll get to more what you do, but let's go back and just get to the beginning. It's like, how, so where are you from? So I'm from Indiana. You, okay, and how'd you end up out here? So I always 
was into pop culture growing up as a kid. I watched a lot of TV and a lot of movies and loved magazines and everything about celebrities. I loved E! back in the day. Yeah. So did you have an, a subscription to Entertainment Weekly? I did, actually. My my parents did. Oh. And so I um, would read it every week. And it's funny that you bring that up because when I was a senior in college, I was like, what do I do? I know I was a telecommunications major and a business minor, but I didn't really know like what I wanted to do. Is this still in Indiana? This is at Indiana University in I, Bloomington. IU. IU. Mm-hmm. And so I went to the local Marsh supermarket. I picked up an Entertainment Weekly, had a picture of Drew Barrymore on the cover, and it said, how to succeed in business without your last name being Barrymore. I <laughs> bought it, and I like read every article about, I, there was an interview with an a William Morris agent. There was an interview. You know, there were interviews with producers and writers. That's awesome. About how they got into the business. And it, like, inspired me. And my friend who was one year ahead of me had moved out to L.A. And he was working at William Morris. He was a an, an assistant in the music department. And we would IM each other, instant message each other. Yeah. Like, when I was at, in my room supposed to be studying, I'd be, like, you know, talking to Adam. Adam Harrison is his name. And... He, I remember he told me, you should think about working in an agency because it takes your TCOM major and your business minor and you could really put them to use. And it's awesome working here. You get to see all these actors and musicians and da, 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 da. And I'm like, oh, LA. And I, around the same time, ran into a couple of friends at a bar at IU and they're like, we're moving to LA after we graduate. And I'm like, I got it. I got to think about LA. And I started calling all of the agencies like the top five at the time agencies and you know sending out my resume and finally one called me back the head of HR at the time and she asked me to fly out to LA and Is I this did. UTA this was UTA okay and I flew out and it was Barb Hansen do you remember Barb Hansen Chris it was Chris Hansen's mom. mom right yeah I think she was she was interviewing at the gone time. by the time Maybe, I got yeah. there because the yeah. HR person when I was there was uh Michael Conway yeah Right. I have a funny story about him too. Yeah. <laughs> so he was so scary and intimidating. He um, he loved me. Yeah. And what's not to love? <laughs> he's yeah. He was just like this very like dry sort of like. Uh, he seemed very like holier than thou. V- v- just like very serious. rarely cracked a smile. Yeah. Never like very well put together. Perfect suits. Perfect very hair. Just a, per- everything was perfect. Right. And he was just so intimidating because you never wanted to disappoint him. Yeah. And also when like an assistant would mess up and if they got fired, he would, if you saw Michael Conway standing next to an assistant's Ooh. desk, it was like the Grim Reaper. <laughs> you knew they were about to get escorted out of the building, down through the lobby and never allowed back in. It's probably, it's probably why he liked me because uh, I was like so young and naive at the time that I just was like... I was like, hey, Michael, how's it going? How's your weekend? <laughs> hey, guy's cool. And I would like go and like sit in his office, like uninvited and like just like chat with him. And I think he Nobody was like, did that. <laughs> I think he Nobody was like, did that. who is this like fucking 23 year old kid with these big baggy Nordstrom rack suits that don't fit him? Like <laughs> totally. just like just like talking to me like oh, we're friends. And that's so funny. But yeah. Um, um, so Barb so Hansen. Barb Hansen. So I flew out to L.A. Like had never been out to L.A. I like stayed downtown because I thought. It was in the middle of everything. I rented a car. It was a Suburban. (laughs) And I drove to UTA. I had like three interviews. And then my buddy had helped me get an interview at William Morris. So I interviewed there. And UTA just seemed like at the time, this was 2001, it was like this really young agency with amazing clients. And there was just a very fresh vibe. And so they were like the cool kid on the block oh, yeah. when we worked there. They represented oh, yeah. like every M. comedy Shyamalan, actor, Jim like Carrey, huge filmmakers. Owen Wilson, Vince Vaughn, Will ben Ferrell. Stiller. Yeah. They repped so many cool people. Yeah. And I wanted to be there. And I was, it was like being, I, I was like, God, this is like out of a movie. I'm like a Hoosier girl. And I grew up surrounded by cornfields. And I'm in LA interviewing here. And so they offered me a job at the end of my third interview. And I was like, I'm coming out to L.A. So I 
drove out two weeks after graduating from college. I drove down to Atlanta. I got my uncle, picked him up, and he drove out with me to L.A. <laughs> and I, and I, and I started like three days later. And I was in the mailroom for a, a month and a half. Mm-hmm. And then I got on this this agent's desk who had like spiky hair and hoop earrings and didn't wear a suit ever. And that was Chris Colon. And he was the head of the alternative department, which basically means non-scripted. Yeah. Alternative to scripted. So he was your first. He was my first boss outside of after college. Yeah. And so is still your boss today. He is we'll still hear, my boss We'll today. hear more of that story. But yeah. like, isn't it? It's fucking crazy. Like you think about these like serendipitous moments and yeah. like things that happen in your life. Totally. Like what if you would have gotten on like. Peter well, Benedict's did. desk I almost or got something. on James like... Degas's desk. Oh, yeah. Remember James Degas? I do. Scripted agent because he had an opening for an assistant. And I, like, interviewed with him. And then I had interviewed with Chris. And I feel like James, uh, he, you know, said, oh, if you're up to it, I'd, you know, I'd totally love to. I mean, he didn't say it like that. But, like, you know, he offered me the job. And then I think Chris offered me the job and I just took Chris's because I felt like it was like a new frontier what mm-hmm. he was doing this was 2001 it was kind of the beginning of really like you know the you know um who wants to be a millionaire had come over recently and survivor was blowing up and he was signing all of these clients who are so exciting and yet he used to be a talent agent himself so he was also repping talent so like Pamela Anderson would call in and Actually, a lot of Baywatch women, like Carmen Electra and <laughs> all these people. And, yeah. You actors. know what's funny about, so so you were doing the, the alternative, they called it, with yeah. Chris. And I was in TV talent with Ruthann. Yep. And at the time, you know, reality hadn't, it, it wasn't what it was, obviously. It was sort of this right. versioning, like, weird thing that some people got. It was stuff. also threatening to a lot of writers because sure. it was taking away, you know, jobs and and time slots and um a lot of people were a little bit upset by it Mm -hmm. and it wasn't i feel like until a few years later when people really started embracing it at the agency well it's like a business opportunity and and like a way to make their clients more money because i was what i was gonna say is i would get these calls from places and you know my first asian boss ruthann she represented um a bunch of comics she represented Kevin Hart at the time, yes. and he was like nobody. Oh, he used to come in all the yeah, time. Yeah, he was just like this, like and literally just hang out. Yeah, in his agent's offices. He had like failed sitcoms. Yep. He was like a road he, comic. Like, oh just, yeah, like, he played basketball all the time with all the assistants. <laughs> He'd just walk in. You'd see him all the time. Yeah, mm-hmm. and he would get so she would get these calls for people like that, like for Tori Spelling, and and. It'd be like, oh, so um, we want to, you know, from a network or a, a production company or something, like, oh, we want to, like, talk about a project that's, like, you know, da da And she'd be like, oh, send it to Alternative. Like, just, ugh. Yeah. Just send it. Like, almost send as, it like. Send it to Lee Horvitz. Like, yeah, exactly. It's like, Lee he's, Horvitz. he's send Lee Horvitz. Send it to yeah. Lee. He's, he's the he's the agent on that yeah. team, like, that, that deals with that shit. But it's just, like, almost, like, ugh. Dismissive. Like, I don't have time for Red this. Like, I'm trying out. to, like, cast totally. them in, like you know sitcoms like exactly. i don't know exactly that's and how it was now like i mean look how much money there is in like putting talent into these like docu type shows oh, or yeah. format shows or whatever I mean, you it's have like, like amy poehler not just executive producing a show on nbc but she's in every episode you yeah. know it's like so i feel like th- yeah it's it's very different now um so how long were you at uta total i was there for five years and were you you were you became an agent i did i was promoted I was really young, but it was because the whole world of non-scripted TV was just growing so quickly that I remember Chris said, I need more bodies in the department. So he promoted me. I was 23. I, you know, had to learn really quickly how to negotiate deals, which that's a funny story. I, you know, started signing my own clients. And it was funny because I remember one producer came in and he met the whole department and he got the dog and pony show. And then... Chris was like, all right, Carrie's going to be your point and your point agent. And um, and he was like, he told me years later, he was like, are you kidding me? Like the young, <laughs> brand new, newly promoted agent is going to be my point agent. So this is funny. I was doing that. I was Did you like, do a good job for him? Um, get him some work? I mean, yeah, I actually did get him some jobs. Um, I don't think 
Yeah, no, he he actually went on to work with us at our next company with me and Chris. Oh wow! So yeah. All right, so you were agenting. So I was agenting. Pitching. Ma- pitching. Wait, what's your funny story about learning to make deals? So I was, I was the only one of the only agents in town the Fourth of July week. I remember, and one of the then agents, Sarah Chazen, was like, "Carrie, can you do this deal for my client?" And he was a showrunner, and MTV wanted to hire him to showrun one of their series. And I was like, okay, well, I don't, I've never done a deal before. So I kind of need some help on, like, what do you think I should ask in terms of his rate, um, back end, all of that. She was like, okay, have this other agent, I won't say his name, another agent in our department um, help you out because I'm going out of town. So it was like me and this one other agent who who were in town for the week. And he said, all right, well, ask for a package. Ask for this astronomical rate. And it was MTV. Their budgets were, budgets were not high. And he was like, at, you know, ask for this huge back end and all this. So I went back to them. I asked for a package, um, which it wasn't a package. They had, <laughs> they had wanted to hire him onto a show. It was like mm-hmm. a staffing job. And anyway, it was, it was very aggressive. And I remember the BA exec saying, are you new? And I went, what? And she said, is this your first deal? <laughs> and I went, no, what, what do you mean? She said, there's no way that you've done this before if this is what you're asking for. Uh-huh. And I was like, um, no, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm, I'm, no, I've done several deals. <laughs> it was, humiliating you got called out for Mm -hmm. your first deal that's awesome uh all right so then what happened because you you jumped ship so then it was very jerry Maguire. so then chris uh colon who was the head of the alternative department he left to run this british production company their la office and it was rdf media and they were famous for you know they're well known for wife swap Mm -hmm. and formats like that that had come over to the United States and done really, really well. Wife swap had aired on ABC for several seasons. And I think he had done a great job with them as their agent. They said, we want to make, you know, we'd love to hire you as our CEO. And, and so I went with him and, you know, we essentially, it was like a startup. We started the new, you know, office out of Santa Monica. I mean, it was, it was really exciting. We had to, you know, make all these new hires and figure out things like how to, you know, set up a phone line and that know, is exciting. All those kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> it was like it was a total startup. What operation. was your what was um, your job there? Or what your... So I, I mean, I when I was at RDF, I did a few things. So because I had been an agent, we decided that we wanted to still work with other production companies under RDF. What we did was we started a management company Mm. and I worked with all of these third-party production companies. And so I would be working with a lot of British production companies and helping them develop their shows and then selling them in the States. So it was kind of like I was in development, but I was really um, also in a way agenting Mm. again. Because I was like, you know, talking to these these international companies, hearing about their projects and then developing them with them or coming up with a strategy on how to sell them here. So I worked with um, Objective, who had Darren Brown. Mm, we, were we were talking about, talking about Darren, Darren Brown, Brown earlier. Yeah, He's a I'm huge a, fan of Darren I'm Brown. I am too. Darren Brown. So I got to help them sell a show with Darren and drive Darren around the U.S., which is amazing. Oh, so Everybody should look up videos of darren brown no, online. like literally like literally. pause the podcast go to netflix <laughs> go, he has watch his, netflix he has a show. his netflix i would start with his stuff that's on it's all on youtube like yeah. like the i think his first one was called trick or treat my well the, was mind it control mind control i think then there's the system trick or treat and then the what's what's his one on netflix called the um it's not the host it's like it's not the push the, it's something, it's something like, like that. that it's like the something uh, but i'm sure if you just search darren brown on Netflix the the concept is essentially can he control someone's mind to the point where they would murder somebody <laughs> yeah <laughs> and how he does it <laughs> yeah it's really it's really fucked up and interesting um so okay then that was that was at RDF 
It's called The Push. The Push. Oh, it is called The Push. Yeah, The Push. Um, so that was at RDF. So I was at RDF for three and a half years. Mm-hmm. And we sold several shows. Um, but then Chris. I still remember decided. coming down and having lunch with you on like the Third Street Promenade. Yep. Because you were in like the Clock Tower building yeah. in Santa Monica, right? Oh, yeah. It was great. Yeah. We're on like Second Santa Monica. Yes. But we were right by the Promenade. So it was really loud. But it was awesome. Ocean Breeze is coming in. Oh, that's a good spot. So, so we were there for about four, three and a half, four years. And in that time, we were successful in selling, you know, a lot of um, formats like Secret Millionaire. Um, and we sold, you know, uh, Don't Forget the Lyrics mm. and Find My Family, which was a Dutch format that I'd picked up at MIPCOM. It's now actually airing on TLC as Long Lost Family. And then Chris wanted to start his own production company and did so in March 2010. So I had to work out my contract. But, you know, um, a few months later, I actually joined Kinetic because at RDF, he hired a lot of third party production companies to produce our shows because I think having come as an agent, he was still learning how to produce. Yeah. So he said at Kinetic, I, I, we are going to be producing and we are going to be in control of all of our shows and responsible for the creative and what's delivered and and so he started kinetic in march yeah march 2010 how does and if this is like private information or this is like some uh, if this is chris's story but like how does one just start a production company like did he have a show that he'd sold that was like the first show did he have was there like investors was he like spending his own money like how does quickly got investors but at the very beginning he was self-financing yeah which is pretty crazy because he you know he had a vision and he hired staff um but quick pretty quickly um proceben which is a pan-european group um it's a they're based out of uh, out of Munich. Um, they invested in him, and so the, they bought a stake. They in the do company. like TV, so they do. Pr- film yeah. production stuff. Yeah, so it, so Proseben Satines um, is sounds like a pharmacy. You're know, like yeah, yeah, kind <laughs> of. No, um, it's a network, and they have uh, they had at the time several networks around the globe. And they created an entertainment kind of arm of Proceben called Red Arrow. And Red Arrow um, was like the creative um, creative organization under which all of these companies, um, like Kinetic, were based. So we were the first company as part of that became part of Red Arrow. We were the first American company. Um, Sorry, the first American company. And they invested in him pretty quickly after he started Kinetic. And he had, so I mean, he obviously had like he, crazy they, relationships from like all the years at UTA yeah. and RDF and everything. Yeah, so. he had been an agent for a really long time. And then when he was at RDF, he was, you know, amazing at packaging shows and, and selling them. Like, I think he sold like 36 shows in three and a half years. Wow. It was really good. That's but crazy. at Kinetic, his focus was, of course, on selling shows but being super hands-on in the production of them. Gotcha. So that was really interesting to watch and be a part of. And so Red Arrow had multiple companies around the globe, including a company called um, Snowman in Denmark, and they were the creators of Married at First Sight, right, which has been become a really successful show in the States. Yeah. So, and... We started the company and pretty quickly, you know, we we had we got the rights to um, off the rockers and packaged Betty White into it Mm -hmm. and sold that to NBC. So, you know, which was like a really, really, really fun prank show. How early on was uh, was Married at First Sight? Married at First Sight was about four years in. Oh, okay, so that wasn't yeah. like your first, no. the Kinetic's first big thing. No, our first was like a Nat Geo show. Then we had. Um, Off the Rockers, which was a success. You know, it was on for a few seasons, and everybody loves Betty White. Mm-hmm. Seen her. I remember it. It was funny. Yeah, it was super funny. Then we had The Taste, which we created here, which was a 
cooking competition series on ABC. It was the first time Bourdain had done broadcast network mm. TV. And nobody thought he would ever do broadcast network TV, right? Because he was very, very particular of how he spent his time and what he did. And so we came up with the idea of the taste. And we thought, who is a talent in the cooking space or the food space that's ungettable? And we knew his, Chris knew his attorney. So Chris called him up, pitched the show idea. And, you know, then eventually we got to talk to Bourdain and he loved the idea and was like, I'm in. So then we decided to go to Nigella Lawson and Nigella Lawson was in and we, you know, eventually cast two other chefs, but it was pretty amazing to have Bourdain that's awesome. Being a part of one of our shows. You've worked with really cool people. <laughs> yeah. That's so lucky. cool. Yeah. Uh, so so you went from, you eventually went from RDF and just and rejoined Chris at Kinetic. Yeah, I see a pattern here. So, <laughs> uh, which is, I mean, which is great. I don't, oh, it's like, great. Like, so cool so. that you found someone that you love working with and work well with and yes. know, has, has uh, brought you on the journey. But Super also, lucky. like, you know, I'm sure you're a big part of why that journey has been successful for him. The, so now you're at Kinetic and it's been how long? Five, it's six? It's been almost 10 years. You've been here for 10 years? Almost. No, you haven't. Yeah. How old are we? <laughs> oh my God, I'm old as dirt. Damn. Okay, so 10 years. So you're the head of development. Yep. What does that mean? So I'm co-head of development. Got to give props to my ride or die, Katie Griffin, who's mm -hmm. the other head of development with me. She's awesome. So she actually was at RDF with us, so... Chris and I and Katie have worked together for over a decade. I've worked with Chris for like 19 years, and Katie's been, it's been over a decade. So she and I um, run development, which means we're kind of in charge of creatively, um, in charge of coming up with the ideas and shepherding, you know, all creative ideas that come through Kinetic. So we'll come up with them. We'll have people come in and pitch us ideas. We'll, you know, and then... Um, it's our responsibility to sell these ideas, right? Yeah. So. And I mean, you know, I just obviously went through this process with you, so I, I saw it firsthand. Yeah. Um, but it was it, it was it was fun. It was, you know, it was I don't want to say easy, but it was like painless, I guess. Yeah. You know, so I had an idea um for a show and I took it out to a few production companies, came and met with you, just kind of showed you like the the write up I done and the idea and you're like oh, I think I think I like it and then you know we made a partnership and then we worked on it you know in the, between us to try to like put the sales package whatever it was to take out to networks yep and then we went out and met with a bunch of networks and yeah. Got someone him. yeah made an offer yep and so that's that's like for me this was like a first time once in a lifetime thing but you do that like you know, All hundreds time. of times yeah. a week. <laughs> a lot. And it was, I have to say, the process of working with you was really fun. And even though there was a lot of work involved in really fleshing out the idea, honestly, though, you had it really, really well. Um, you had established what the show was and what the arc of the, of the season was going to be and everything, so you made it easy. But, you know, you still have to put together a sizzle reel mm -hmm. and just present the best package you can. So, but it was actually like an easy process working with you on it. It was good, you right? Had a, you had an amazing idea and then, and then you've worked in development. So you knew how, you knew how to develop the show. So you came in with it fully developed and then you could help, you helped us with shaping it, the sizzle reel, which is like a two to three minute reel producers used to sell the show in the in the room with buyers and so and then in the pitch meeting you just didn't sit back quietly like you were involved in really verbalizing exactly how the show is going to be and so well, I just never shut also, up so it's like I know but it's great <laughs> also because of your experience being um you know producer on like a really successful show right now everybody mm -hmm. loves Going into the rooms, people would be like, can you tell me what's happening with so-and-so and so-and-so? And, -so? and even though you were really good about being, you know, keep, you know, keeping that information um, 
secret. Um, you know, I think that people want to be in business with somebody who's involved with like a really hit show, with yeah. a really great show, who actually has a um, a real part in like shaping that show. Yeah. You know, so it was like everything came together and worked perfectly. It aligned. What percentage of the of the shows that you develop are original ideas that you and Katie are like, let's do a show about marshmallow makers or what what are like so, ideas that come in the door what are format how what percentage formats i would say the percentage of ideas that are generated internally and it's they're not just generated from me and katie like we have an amazing vp um paul lima who um just created a show that aired on discovery called man versus bear we have just an incredible team who are always always pitching us show ideas and we've sold shows from the you know that have um started with with their ideas and chris actually came up with a show that um dropped today on netflix called love is blind so i would say probably 95 percent, 97 percent of our shows are internally gener- generated um yeah, I mean, I'm looking around at our shows, and I feel like, you know, Married at First Sight was a Dutch format from one of our sister companies, and that's an incredibly successful show, but that that was from our sister company. Little Women was um, Katie's idea, mm-hmm. and the taste was internally generated. Off the Rockers was a Belgian format. So, but lately, I feel like, most of our shows we're selling are our own ideas. What um, what would you say to people? So you're literally in the business of like creating and selling reality shows, and uh, you know, unlike scripted television or movies, reality is one of those spaces where like everyone has an idea for a reality show, and everyone thinks it's like. Oh, there I did. You know, it's like, oh, I got an idea for a reality show. So what would you say to someone that like is actually like, oh, I've got a re- an idea for re- a reality show. Like, what do they need? What do they do? Or like, just like, don't bother, bro, because it's, <laughs> it's people that are working full time out there, you know, trying to make this happen. I mean, if it's somebody who has no experience working in non-scripted or in entertainment it's going to be pretty tough because yeah. you have to find a way to get that idea to either an agent or a producer. It's really hard for agents or producers to take you seriously if you're somebody who hasn't worked in the business. If you're somebody who, say, comes from like the scripted world, and you've got an idea, like you can ask your agent to you know, send your idea to the non-scripted person at the agency who they recommend. But... If you're somebody who, say, somebody who's listening right now and you want to, you have an amazing idea, I mean, it's, it depends. If you have a cast of people who you think are just incredible, then figure out a way to get to, you know, um, I don't know. It's hard. You can go get to a production company, but a lot of them are going to be afraid to look at your idea because. Mm. They don't want to be accused of ripping it off in the future if they have something that is at all similar in the same world. It's really tough, you know, like um, figure out a way to, I don't know, if you're somebody who is in L.A. and you're you're working at a in the entertainment business, you know, at a try and get a job at a production company and then you you know they'll trust you and and you can start pitching your show ideas i mean i know that's not doable for most people well but the, i think it's i very think very hard it's it's good to say though and good for people here because it's like i think that people have this misperception of like reality tv is just like oh it's just like pff, i got an yeah. idea for that like and it's like the truth is there are like hundreds of dedicated professionals that work full time at like established production companies and networks and studios that are like coming up with ideas, but also like packaging, like, cause a, a, a lot of times an idea is not going to sell. It's right. like, and I had a, uh, when I was an assistant at ABC studios, they would do these like talks with the executives for the assistants and the president, Steve McPherson at the time, um, he gave a talk and one of the assistants was like, 
hey, um, would you be opening to would you be open to hearing uh, ideas for reality shows uh, from the assistants? And he was like, no, no, I wouldn't. And and he said, and this is what he said. And I repeat this a lot. He's like, in in reality, the idea is not the currency. The there are a yep. million ideas. Everybody yes. has a Everybody. fucking idea. Yeah. The idea is not oh, yeah. what's going to sell. It's the idea plus the auspices, and that yes. that can mean the talent that's attached. Like yes. you put Anthony Bourdain on the yeah. taste before you took it out, right? Or it's the production company, right. like you know, you Evolution, a company I work at. You know, they they make all these great docu soaps. So a company, a network would be like, oh, I want to be in a totally. uh, business with Evolution totally. or talent. Yeah. You know, like a group of interesting people. That's what originally sold Real Housewives of Orange County. It wasn't like just this concept of like, let's shoot a show inside people's homes and follow their lives. Right. That's just, that's not a good idea. Right. But it's like they brought them tape of yes. people that were interesting. And yeah. Like, that's what sold the show. Totally. So you I, need something that proprietary element. You need that that have to have, you know, piece of the puzzle. And if you're somebody who has no ties, it is going to be really tough. Yeah. It is. Um, so. But getting a job, if you're interested in like pitching yeah. and selling shows, like getting a job in, uh, at a production company is, I yeah. mean, it's a great place to start because there are. Oh yeah. Development departments of yes. that where people get paid and they have assistants and coordinators and there's like entry level jobs in these. Yeah. There these are so many production companies. So you can. You know, look at the UTA job list for openings in the non-scripted space or scripted space. Um, there are ways to do it. It's not easy. Yeah. So, but if you really want to do it, you can do it. What do you... It's just a process. It is a process. What do you love about your job and what do you hate about your job? Well, I love that I get to take my obsession with pop culture and apply it to coming up with new ideas. Um, you know, like I used to joke with my college roommates about having this useless knowledge of like celebrity, <laughs> random celebrity, uh, you know, whatever trivia. And now we'll be in a meeting and I'll be like, no, 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 she's been married three times and they they're divorcing. So we should actually reach out to her about this new idea. And like, I love that I'll be driving and look at a billboard and I'll be able to go, that tagline's interesting. I wonder if we could use that for a non-scripted idea. I will be listening to, you know, Sirius and a song will come on. I'll be like, that's a great song title. I think there's a show with that, using that title. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like your brain is always going and it's fun. And even though it's, Sure, it's a high pressure job. It's still what we're doing is making television, which if you're a person like I was who grew up watching hours of MTV, like hours of MTV every day, and now you're the person who's seen how you find the cast and how you the stories come to be, like it's so fun, you mm -hmm. know? The behind the scenes, like you just I just eat it up. I love it. What do you love it. what do you hate about your job? I hate um that's a really good question. What do I hate about my job? I don't hate anything about my job. I literally enjoy coming to work. I'm excited about coming uh -huh. to work. I love it. Or what's like the downside? Like what's what happens that'll make you have like a bad day at work? Yeah, I mean, right now I um I feel like couple things you know it's it's discouraging when you spend a lot of time on a project and you think for sure it's gonna sell and then it doesn't and then you've spent months and months at a time um you know f f you know going out and finding the cast of 12 contestants and putting together the perfect package project and nobody buys it um that's why that's i got out of development because it was like soul crushing it can be soul crushing you get like, so passionate and spend so much time, and then it, they oh, just yeah. be like, pass, 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 pass. And like, yeah. that was for nothing. Yeah. I mean, you have to be ready for that, and you have to very quickly move on and, and not get emotional about it. I mean, there are times occasionally I'll I'll still get, you know, like really, um, really, like just ugh, down about something that didn't sell. 
But for the most part, I just, you just move on. Um, that's tough. And also the fact that these days, um, you know, unless you have multiple buyers, um, it's rare to get something picked up straight to series, yeah. you know, so you do a ton of work for a little bit of money, you know, paid development, a presentation, that kind of thing. So that's why it's so important and why we really try and take something that's so it's packaged amazingly or it's such a loud, provocative idea that people know that they need to move quickly on it and make a larger commitment. Mm-hmm. So what last question? I know we have work to do. You have TV shows to create, and I have Vanderpump Rules to to make. Ugh, um, so dumb. What what uh, what advice do you give to people that want to work in the industry or want to do what you did and move to LA? Like, what do what do these people need to do? So, if you want to move out to the to LA or you want to work in the industry, you need to be extremely motivated and tenacious and Try and, um, I mean, now you have resources at your fingertips, like the internet, which I had, but I didn't really have, like, at the time, Facebook, where there was a a Facebook page for Hoosiers, you know, in Hollywood. Like, Mm -hmm. take advantage of, you know, reach out to alumni, reach out to um, look at the UTA job list, reach out to people who... Maybe you read interviews with them. You hear them on podcast. Be tenacious and and um, contact them and and get just get your foot in the door somewhere because everything leads to a new opportunity. If you get your foot in the door at a production company, like if you want to make TV, whether it's developing or whether it's producing, like you do, then you need to start whether it's as an office PA or a PA on a show, like you're going to start really low. You're going to get paid nothing. But if you are a hard worker with a great attitude, people will have you continue to work for them. And then you'll just rise up and rise up and rise up. But I remember my senior year at IU, I was in a journalism class and it was my, sorry, it was my sophomore year. And a, like a PR guy from Spin Magazine came to speak to our journalism class he had gone to IU and after class I went up to him and introduced myself and I asked him if spin ever had interns and he was like yeah we do have an internship program so give me your information or or he said no he said here's my card you know email me and I sure enough emailed him and he said you know you were the only student who came up to me after class Mm -hmm. the only student and I ended up you know, moving out to New York for a summer and interning at Spin Magazine. Because I thought at the time I wanted to work in magazines. But, you know, you have to be tenacious and do do not um, assume that anything will be given to you. That's great. All because you had the the courage and just, like, the balls to just go up to the guy. Which, like, by the way, like, no one's going to care. Like, don't, you know, like, don't be scared. Like, people don't, don't mind, be scared. like... like getting asked questions and yes you know so and, that's good and so just get your foot in the door be resourceful figure out how there's always a way i mean i i knew one person one person who had moved out to la and he got me an interview helped me get an interview at one place and that wasn't that wasn't even the place where i ended up working i was the i was in my bedroom calling from my landline because we didn't have cell phones really then or i didn't have one calling all the agencies every day leaving voicemails saying I, you know i sent my resume like i was on it and i was super like very motivated so you just have to you know you have to be that person it's good advice uh carrie it's not an understatement to say that you are literally one of my favorite people in same with you in the town in the industry so thanks same. for taking the time to do this you're welcome That's and fine. uh yeah i appreciate it all right all right i hope you guys enjoyed my talk with carrie she's awesome that was fun uh thank you guys for listening i really do appreciate it if you haven't already please go on to itunes or spotify or apple Podcasts, wherever you're listening and like leave a review subscribe drop a rating anything you can do to just help get this podcast into the ears of more people i really 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 would appreciate it i hope you guys are enjoying 
the episodes. I'm not releasing them as frequently as I was during season one, but uh, I do have more already in the can. They will be coming soon, and I think you're going to like them. So please stay tuned, and I will see you guys next time. Bye.